to the Bean Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. Well, hey, Ronnie, how are you doing today? Where are you calling in from? Oh, man, having an amazing time here in Bangkok. It's, uh, it's a great time to be alive. And, you know, uh, like we were discussing earlier, uh, Bangkok's on a shutdown for about a couple of weeks. So, you know, there's a lot of people from the DC who come down to Bangkok and they've seen DCPKK and everything else. So it's kind of funny that you can't actually uh, go to any bars. You know, my favorite my favorite dance bars at Nana Plaza are closed, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we all have to make sacrifices during this difficult yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and my heart reaches out to everybody who's suffering during this time too, right? I mean, yeah, you know, we were talking about uh, some some of us have employees in the Philippines, and Philippines especially is hit pretty hard. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we were talking about what you guys had actually done to help your employees out, and I'm sure that's uh, that's something that you know would not be forgotten by any one of your employees, and I'm sure some other people are taking similar measures as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of this comes down to really effective conversations. It's not something you can ignore. So the more you can own the information that you have a good understanding around and communicate that to your teams so that they're clear around where things are, but also feel open to share with you where they're having concerns or where they're starting to get uh, a bit frightened about things. Honestly, lockdowns are something kind of new to everybody. I know it's not something I've yeah. experienced. <laughs> So just <laughs> trying to figure out how we live through this uh, has been kind of unique. I know we're kind of built for this in the sense that we have remote teams. We've worked uh, in this fashion since we were founded five years ago. But I'm seeing in social just a lot of chatter about people trying to figure out how do you move to remote? How do you maintain effectiveness in, in what is a new style of work for them? And it's going to be an amazing test, like a test case, right? Like a case study on like working from home. We're all now forced yeah. to, and people need to adapt. Well, yeah, I mean, having a distributed team, I think I definitely agree with you. Like if, if, if you, like, you know, we were founded five years ago, like yourself, and, you know, just having, just having the, the opportunity to actually work in a distributed team or a remote team, whichever way the term you like using, is, is quite, it's kind of like a boon. I mean, uh, you know, there's other companies that have done that. Basecamp, Basecamp's been doing it for 10 years. They're pretty well known. The Birdcap's another one that's been doing it for seven years. And, you know, so there, there are certain, there's, there's certain teams out there and certain companies out there. I mean, of course, DC and even bigger than any company out of the DC as well, which, which actually have that approach. So uh, I have a friend who works for uh, Asian Development Bank, you know, which is part of the World Bank. And they were actually talking about... Uh, the, the whole process of actually working remotely and especially for banking where everything is so secured and you know how how exactly the whole process goes and he was like look man it's a, it's, a, it's a nightmare to keep our processes together to keep you know uh, you know it's the left hand talking to the right hand how does that happen and you know how and he said so far the process hasn't broken but he says you can see cracks in the process mm -hmm. which is quite which is quite important right absolutely so it's kind of fitting because today we really had set this up a, f a few weeks back and we're really here to share with our audience a bit just about your backstory and your experience as a digital nomad and an e-commerce entrepreneur. So yeah, I, I know we've connected <laughs> through the Dynamite Circle. You, you mentioned the DC. It's really, it's a community of digital nomads. Tell me about your introduction to the scene and your experience as a traveling e-commerce entrepreneur. Why and how did you get started? Yeah, well, I started about like five years ago because I, I was doing, I was doing, uh, uh, I, I worked for like bigger companies in Canada. So just a background about myself, I immigrated to Canada as an adult. So I'm an adult immigrant to Canada. So I moved to Canada when I was 22. Uh, we got the golden ticket. My, my mom had applied for a, for a visa. So we all came together to Canada. Uh, you know, uh, first, I think I landed on the 14th of May. And on the 15th of May, I got, I, I got a job working at an Indian radio station. So it's, it's like, it's not just any radio station. So I was doing like door to door media sales. So like yeah. literally like going door to door and not just like at, at, at like any, at like going to like strip malls full of like Indian stores and say, Hey, would you like to buy some Indian radio? And add to the fact that I didn't have a car. So basically I had to take like public transit, like buses and trains so that I could go and do that. So I did that for a couple of years, which is kind of, huh. it's kind of like a yeah, heartbreaking experience, but it was, it was nice, you know, the, the true hustle. Yeah. yeah, it was, yeah, it, it is managed door to door sales. Like if, 
you better learn how to do door to door sales if you if you really want to do what you know what like sales is like you should know how to do door to door sales but yeah i mean I, i was lucky after that you know i i got, I got an opportunity to uh, to work at hsbc a uh, big bank definitely uh, wouldn't recommend <laughs> recommend that for anybody who uh, wants to be an entrepreneur because i mean it's uh, you know lots of processes you know it takes about 6 months to get a get a marketing campaign approved so of course i was a big fan of that so i said okay like i got to leave this but then i had an opportunity to go work at best buy and at best buy i learned a lot about uh, how retail cycles work you know how does retail work you know and best buy was quite a it was quite a good fit for a personality like mine because everything was just go 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 so nothing ever stopped so uh, you know from 8 am to like 10 pm at night everything was always on on the go so that was quite kind of like an interesting experience for me so i did it for a couple of years uh you know got an opportunity to move to australia uh, worked in australia for a couple of years working for the west farmers group so i worked on target australia and then uh bunnings which was uh, you know uh, coming from a background in retail so i worked with that, those guys till i till i had an opportunity to actually like you know start doing till i said look hey wait a second you know i've been doing this for for so long is there a chance that i can actually run an e-commerce business so i uh, i had an opportunity to 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 do some freelance marketing like for for a, for a wash brand back in the day and i said look i've been i've been working on this for so long making other people money i said why can't i ever you know the one thing i owe to myself is the opportunity to take a chance on myself and i said look wh- whatever happens happens like if if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out but i need to take a chance on myself so i had like 10000 dollars in hand i said look let's just let's just try it out and so here we are you know uh, five or six years later you know we sell in about 55 different countries uh, and yeah and Got, got got lucky along the way to be honest with you and that's amazing I, I i know i'm a big fan of the podcast how i built this by guy ross so share yeah. with me a little bit about the brandio genesis story so and let me know like did you have any doubts before you started the brand yeah oh for sure like it's uh, i definitely had a lot of doubts so uh, when 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 i started the first the first uh, three months I I basically wasted and I would say um, I would say learn but you know wasted was basically like looking back at it I said I had I had somebody in Vancouver and basically I hired a uh, a factory in China and I didn't know anything I didn't know how this process works I didn't know how sourcing work I, I had zero clue how to do it uh and about 3 months in I was basically left with uh you know about $2000 in the bank account and I was like shit I I, I don't know if I'm going to succeed with this like what well, what's going to happen and the watches won't understand it and somehow some way I read I read that there was a there was a watch fair in Hong Kong yeah. and uh, and a ticket from Vancouver to 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 Hong Kong was about I think about like $1000 done so I said look if I can do it I'm going to I have to go there in person I have to meet everybody who I need to meet in person I have to meet the the shippers the box guys the the watch guys uh if i need to negotiate a credit term all of it has to be done in person because that's how agents operate that's how agent business works right everything is done in person and most likely agents won't give you credit until unless you've met them met the families you built a big rapport with them yeah so i literally was on the next plane to hong kong and in two weeks i met all the suppliers i got all my ne- negotiated deals they were kind enough to give me a 25% credit up front for all my inventory so i said look just give me whatever you have i'll take it i'll just private label it and we'll actually sell it online so you know what i could do in like 3 to 6 months was done in 2 weeks and with some fast thinking and some you know quick hustling and talking to all the factory suppliers talking to all the box makers talking to getting the right licensing deals in place getting the right movements in place so yeah so it all came together at the right place so i was i was kind of lucky with that uh, with that factor in the sense that people took a chance on me as much as i took a chance on them but i think it was more them taking a chance on me and pro- yeah i see a lot of it though being strategic i think you pro- probably had a number of you had the dots into where you needed to connect right so it's just about how do i then get boots on the ground and start drawing the lines between these dots yeah for sure it it look it it, it turns out to be one of those things where it's like okay so you there's about a, there's about 500 watchmakers in one place right so you need to you need to start looking at you need to spend like so it's probably a week so every day i would get up at 8 a.m. and i'd be busy till 8 pm and i'd go meet meet each and every guy and over the uh, on the 6th day which was and i had just almost given up i met a guy and he, and i told him my story and he said he said look why don't you come see me in shenzhen i'm going to figure something out so he actually took me to shenzhen to give me a tour of his factory we drank tea for like 2 hours i don't know i've never drank so much tea in my life <laughs> and basically i met his family you know his grandparents his kids and he says look it's you know you're a young guy he says you know we'll, we'll take a chance on you. And, and that and that was 
you know one of the most phenomenal things any 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 anybody anybody's ever done. So that turned out to be like one of the biggest things. Yeah, it was it was basically the break I was looking for. And then basically like through him, the supply, the boxes, the packaging, the shipping, he did everything for me. I didn't need to do anything. And plus I got a I got a twenty five thousand dollar line of credit straight off the bat, uh, which was unheard of. Like I didn't pay him anything up front. I paid him after, you know, I started making some money. That's amazing. I, I can relate yeah. to that. I think very early in my career, my father in law had told me your success in your career will be defined by the people you meet and the books you read. And I think that's played such a huge part. I'm a very social person. So for me, I've been more on the people I've met side of that equation. And I've just recently started to invest in personal development, really start trying to pick up my reading game. But you've, you've kind of shared an example. Has that been true in your career? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, the idea that hopefully the goal is to read about 52 books uh, in the next six months. Uh, try, try, try and at least do it instead of a year, like try and do 52 books in the next, you know, try and do two books a week. But yeah. so far, I'm a little behind on that goal. But yeah, so so right now, uh, you know, uh, we uh, I usually talk about with people about EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating Absolutely. System. That, that's a good one for people who are trying to run their business and they're trying to run remote distributed teams, how to get everybody under one umbrella. So there's a couple of books out there, which is, you know, Gina Workman's the guy who wrote it, who, who wrote it. So you have Get a Grip, which is kind of like a, a good, let's try, try a book for him. Uh, I, lo- I, love, I love recommending, uh, you know, uh, anything out of the Bill Gates notes. So right now I'm reading this book called uh, Educated by Tara Westova, uh, which actually is kind of, a, uh, it's, a, it's a true story about this girl who uh, grew up in a, in a Mormon background, but it's still kind of interesting. So you can't, you can't always read like business books, man. Uh, yes. And I read, I read one recently, which is about productivity, which is written by a Canadian author, uh, Chris Bailey. Uh, which actually talks about, you know, how, what can you do to be more creative? Like, you know, stuff like journaling, uh, gratitude journal, like, you know, how, why you should be writing everything on paper, why you need a VA, how, how to get, uh, get over this kind of stuff. Like so, super practical. Yeah, super practical stuff. Yeah. You know, if you, if you just follow it to the T, I mean, I have the book lying around somewhere, but it's like, if you just follow everything to the T, you should be, you, should, you know, you can be a lot more, you don't need to work for 20 hours. Like this, he's actually yeah. given like examples. I work 60 hours, I work 80 hours and I work 20 hours. The twenty-hour work weeks were probably the most productive in his whole life, and he says the reason was I sat down and I just got stuff done. I didn't open my Facebook, I didn't open my Messenger, I didn't open my WhatsApp, I didn't get distracted by side people like distracting me from from what I wanted to do. Right, the two-hour lunch, and yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, and especially like he talks about stuff like meditation, right? It's like I'm not, I haven't tried it as much. I should be, but the thing is, like, what uh, even. I was I was uh, hearing hearing about it from some other person today. They said uh, the, that this girl out there, she went and interviewed thirty CEOs uh, during the COVID crisis. So people who own companies between two million to five hundred million dollars. And what she found out was the the people who were the most unfazed by it were only three people, three CEOs, right? And what they had in common was uh, was a couple of facts. One of them was they were actually looking at. Uh, the COVID crisis as an opportunity. They use the word buy a lot in their sentences. And the third thing was actually all three of them meditated uh, in the morning for at least like five to 10 minutes. So they were calm about the whole situation because of this, uh, you know. Right, they worked the brain space. Yeah. Yeah, they exactly. So it's like, it's one of the, right. yeah, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a focus thing. It's like, you know, how, how much can you focus? Can you remain calm? Like, you know, usually uh, we, we, we tend, we, our brains tend to be like, choppy seas, right? How can you how can you uh, have doldrums in your brain, which is basically like everything is calm, nothing is emotional, you know, your decisions are not as driven by the emotion that you have. And, you know, I'm personally, I'm a very emotional guy. So I think for people like me, I need to try it as often as possible. I can empathize. And then you also hear the tales of, you know, the, the stories of, of the dying, and they reflect back on how they reacted to situations, not exactly what their, you know, what their response was or the immediate reaction was at the time. So it's often that hindsight that allows for us to see how well we really positioned ourselves as individuals or how strong we were in these moments. So I'm hoping to look at this also as, hey, you've, you mentioned some areas, you know, like how people approach working remote. I think we also talked about, you know, base camp guys, they have some awesome resources on remote work and building building up remote teams, as well as um, establishing six-week sprints and designing ways in which you can craft work to be more of that like mental effort that, um, what do they call it? 
not not management task, but more like the big deep thought work. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm curious uh, too. Yeah, I, I just disagree with the with the basic guys. Just with one of the blog posts, which is pay every employee like they live in San Francisco. Like that one, definitely. I don't <laughs> <agree>. <laughs> like, yeah. That you know, no, uh, you know, in San Francisco, hundred and fifteen thousand dollars salary a, a year is considered to be poor. So I'm sorry, you know, I, I'll disagree with them on that one. Uh, I'll 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 uh, jump on there with you as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm curious now. Let's get back to brand zero. So you, yeah. you're able to source manufacturing. You're able to establish quality. You're able to create gain a line of credit to help with packaging. What did it look like trying to build the brand and establish the storefront? And was it like an instant hit? Like talk me through maybe like your first hundred orders. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I think the first, the first order was basically like it was me. I was, I was the ad guy. I was the manufacturing guy. I was customer service. I was, uh, I was the guy basically running everything. It was like Ronnie's the one man team. Uh, luckily, I, I had you know, some experience in trying to set up Shopify. So I set up a shop. I said, okay, let's let's go with it. Let's see how it goes. The shipping was all set up in China, so it was going to be a drop ship. It was supposed to be a drop ship uh, store initially, but no, it, you know, we evolved it from there. But it was, I mean, it's not dropship. It was like private label. And basically we would just, you know, ship from China. And people would get it globally within seven days. That was that was the, the idea behind it. And I remember the first person coming on and, you know, I had this chat system, you know, live chat, I think back in the day. And basically what you could do is you could follow people to different customer journeys. You could see different pages that they would follow. So I would literally, you know, ping them and chat them up and be like, yo, hey, how can I help you? Is this something I can do for you? And at the, on, the, on the side, I'm managing ads. So it's like, you know, I remember the first girl came from Australia. Uh, and it, it was special because this person who left the room and I and they came back and they said, yo, can you call me on this? I'm looking for a watch and I need it pretty quick. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So, and I told them what, what the deal was. He thought I was some guy, some guy sitting in India because I still have an accent. <laughs> and it was funny, man. Uh, and you know, and it was like, okay, he says, look, I'm going to take, I'm going to trust you with this. Let's do it. So anyway, so we go, you know, he got his order. He was, you know, he, he got it within 10 days, not seven days, but you know, anyway, I was the first order deal closed and said, Hey, can you leave me a review? Can you see how this goes? That was the first order. The hundredth order is also very special because the hundredth order was a Canadian guy and he basically was getting married. So he ordered a watch for him and his groomsmen and we got it. And I, yeah, that was great. It was like a, like a like a bullseye bullseye customer so it was like 10 for one deal so, <laughs> so i remember yeah i remember trying to get give him a discount i was like look it's 20 percent off can he yeah he, and we got we got the watches engraved and basically i remember at his wedding he sent us the wedding pictures and i know what uh, one of the best things that came out of that was uh one of his groomsmen when he got married he came back to us uh and that was uh, in a couple of years and actually ordered like 10 more watches which i thought that's great cool. yeah absolutely. yeah so yeah, so I would never forget that. But what happened was three months in, I got burnt out, man. Like I, you, you get burnt out because you know you. I, I, I think I was there was no exercise. I was going to. I was waking up at uh, waking up at eight eight a.m. and I was going to bed at four a.m. And uh-huh. you know, it, yeah, it catches up, man. But these these are things you look back to and you're like, oh man, you know, these 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 are the sacrifices you've made. These are the sacrifices you you've done to get where you, you know where you are. And I'm sure it's, every entrepreneur out there has, has made sacrifices, but. Having said that, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, we have been through this process. We have been through uh, a system. And today, after five years, I'm sure, like, you know, even being in just a company like yourself would understand, like, hey, you know, we, we have made all these sacrifices to pay where we are so we can actually, like, get our eight hours, nine hours and spend time with the families and kids and everything else. Yeah, and focus on those other things like the morning meditations, like the fitness, trying to... Yeah, reading reading a book, something else, like whatever it is, right? It's like I, I found that reading a book for maybe 10, 15 minutes a day uh, before I even go to sleep is like a, it's a very productive thing. So it actually helps me sleep uh, a lot better than anything else. And then also just interacting within a community. I know the e-commerce community is extremely transparent in certain circles. And I think when you find that right community you're able to really connect and, and knowledge share and learn from others. Um, help me understand, Ronnie, who's on your team now and when did you make your first hire? Yeah, so I have about 20, 23, 24 employees. So, uh, you know, right now I actually don't manage anything uh, on a day-to-day basis. About four months ago, we, we hired a consultant to come in and actually take over the whole organization and to do a, uh, to have a reject. And by the reject, I mean is uh, implement an entrepreneurial operating system or a version of it, right? 
Uh, and this guy, he's, he's in the Dynamo Circle too, a guy called Julian. Uh, and of course, I'm very grateful to him because what happened was after that was uh, I basically started getting eight to nine hours of sleep every day, which was <laughs> exciting. Because before the, before that, I was getting I was lucky if I got five to six hours of sleep. Uh, and what what we did was we implemented a system where I today just directly deal with my execs, right? So I have one person who's an operations manager, I have one person who's a CTO, and I have one person who, who's in marketing. Right, and every week we have a sprint, we have a call, we have scorecards for everything, so we know that you know how much traffic we are driving, what does the conversion rate look like, what does it look like in terms of a future growth potential, what is a gross profit, what is a net profit. So we all have these like seven to eight uh, scorecards that we go through in the meeting at the same time, and it's important that everybody uh, is uh, in the whole organization is is driven by that, right? Uh, of course, that's the hard stuff. The soft stuff would be like what the organizational values are, right? So, for example, our organizational values would be 24 7, 365 service, you know, being resourceful, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, cus- you know, customers always first or customers got that, mm. whichever way you want to look at it. So, the, the, these, these things are, these things are pretty important for us. Like, so uh, those are the pillars of the organization. And, uh, what, what we felt, what I personally felt and what I saw was, when we started instilling these values, and I'm sure Bean Ninjas went through the same process at some point in time in the organization was, who do you want in your organization when you have these core values, right? And you can actually call people out by saying, hey, look, I know you, you're not actually living up to the core values of the organization, right? So we're primarily a customer service driven organization. We are, you know, out of the 22, 23 employees, I would say at least uh, 15 employees or more uh, are customer service. Then we have a couple of guys who are in content, a couple of guys who are influencer marketers, a couple of guys who are uh, just, you know, in operations and a couple of guys who are, whose jobs is just the management sites. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And how has, how has it grown from one brand to now your portfolio? So how do, how do yeah. you decide to, to grow and, and make that decision? Do I just continue to invest my time, my energy in this brand, um, as opposed to the decision to, hey, maybe it's time for me to take this system and try to apply it across other brands. Well, thank thank you for asking me that. Like, it's basically what we wanted to do was we wanted to have a portfolio. So we have a portfolio of fifty different websites. I mean, some of them e-commerce driven, but some of them also. We we actually looked at affiliate sites and we said, hey, look, is there a way that we can actually go out and acquire affiliate sites? Which is basically so you so you have affiliates actually doing pretty well, and you're like, wait a second, it's just better at some point in time for sort of paying them that much money. You might as well just acquire them and see if you can actually like either three or one do take them. Three or one direct them to your website, you know, which will give you a better SEO gain. Or do you say that, hey, if we have these other affiliate websites, can we actually redirect users from those affiliate websites, not to our competitors like they're doing today, and actually like redirect all the traffic to us? And actually, that gives us a lot more cross cross signals and credibility. And what we said was, look, there's different markets out there, right? Like I said, the first, one of the first things I said was we ship to 55 different countries, and all these markets that are there, they're they're, they're growing markets. Can we use these growing markets to actually ship? Uh, and 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 e- and you know in each one of these markets, in some cases, like like I was, I've given an example of South Africa before, is there a way that we can acquire a website which is a very trusted publication in that market for like say fifty sixty thousand dollars, which actually gives us instant credibility. So that's mm-hmm. what, so that that was the thought process behind it. The other thought process is we can take the same brand what we had with watches, can we apply it to like uh, other portfolio of companies? Can we have it with home hardware? Can we use it with furniture? Can we use it with couches? Whatever it is, right? And so we followed that strategy tactically. So the idea is like, you know, when something like this COVID stuff hits, uh, we, we're, in a, we're in a pretty strong position. Like we have a very well, but like, you know, the watches stuff is definitely going to be hit hard because uh, it's a luxury item and people aren't going to buy luxuries. People are going to be focused more on things that, you know, you need on an everyday basis. So people are going to focus. I mean, toilet paper seems like a bad idea and masks, okay, show those in it. Yeah, toilet paper just seems like a bad idea. I mean, you know, there's... There's things like bidets that people could be using, so I kind of, I kind of feel like you know that's I don't need to teach people about that. But you know, you have you have these other options of you know, okay, do, do do you need like linens? Do you need like basic clothing? Do you need like that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. And usually in times of, uh, I don't know, I'd be very careful to say recession, but uh, you know, uh, tighter times would be like a better term. Maybe people would be more focused on actually focused on being, uh, you know, uh, entertainment, uh, entertainment values, on demand services. You know, those things go pretty high. So. So focus on things that actually uh, will balance us out. So home hardware might have gone down, but you know people trying to improve the house, people using like detergents and cleaners in the house. Actually, the demand for those kind of products are actually going up. So we have a pretty well balanced portfolio of sites for that reason. That's awesome. 
So let's get practical. Yeah. So let's share some of the secret sauce. You, you shared a bit about EOS and traction. Are there like maybe three other top strategies or tools that you use to run your distributed team? Yeah, uh, for sure, Slack. <laughs> you know, it's a yeah, great, great, good Canadian company from Vancouver, in fact. So, you know, I, I'd always recommend those guys. Uh, another tool that I use is uh, Hubstaff. So before, uh, I don't know if you guys use something similar to Hubstaff. It basically monitors your uh, remote teams, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to say you need to spy on your team, but I think it's important to have a system like Hubstaff on there. So what time do people check in? What time do people check out? Are people actually, so because we have a lot of employees on shift work, so, you know, are they actually spending time on Facebook? We actually, I made the mistake a long time ago of trusting my employees in certain parts of the world. And what I found out, they were spending an exceedingly uh, long amount of time on Facebook or watching movies on Netflix, and they call it multitasking, which uh, didn't really fly well with me. So, you know, we had to let them go. Another another thing that we actually found was, which I think why, why you want to use Hubstaff is you want to see how effective they are, right? Uh, we, we found a person who actually had hired a VA to do her job. So uh, oh, wow. if, if they were getting paid, yeah, so if they're getting paid at $100, they were paying this person $400 from their own pocket. So they didn't need to work for the whole month. So they're making another $400 for doing nothing for the whole month. And they had a second job elsewhere. Well, so, you know, the, these are the things you need to, uh, I would say, to look out for. I'm not saying you need to be worried of employees. I would say just be uh, careful in, in how you uh, how you deal with them. Uh, you know, hire, hire a good ads expert. You know, e-commerce, it's pretty important for us, you know, to, to, have, to have the right ad expert and everything else. Uh, and, you know, how are they intelligent? Are they proactive? Are they looking? You know, what are the, what is the reporting? Uh, how does the reporting structure work with you? You know, are, are they are your goals aligned and are they together in that sense? Um, yeah, I, I think these two three things are definitely. But they're more they're very soft things. They're very organizational things. But the tools that I'm talking about, they are the things that you need to get set up with, right? Uh, I think one of the things that I personally found, which was very very effective, was actually talking to other entrepreneurs, like talking to you know. Uh, Folks have been in just talking to folks at the like Kian who's who said monetize more, talking to people uh, like Daryl from Big Flair, like all, all these people like who who basically are uh, you know they are they're seasoned entrepreneurs who've, who've had this journey uh, a long time before that I have, uh, who actually would be uh, an open and willing uh, people to actually share those experiences with me. And I think having that organizational support and having that sort of hey look don't worry. We entrepreneurs too. We understand what we can do for you. Uh, Help me out a lot, and I think that I, I'm very grateful to, uh, to them and you know you guys for 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 that. That's awesome. So we're really, I'm interested a little bit too. Like we're always interested in how businesses stay on top of their finances. So who do you have on your accounting team, and any top tip that you would give um, store store owners? Yeah, so basically the way, the way the way our finances work is I have I have somebody uh, in in Canada uh, who also actually does because we are a lot of our business comes to the US who's a CPA in the US as well. So actually, so this person is quite well versed for taxes in Canada and the US. So they do all the bookkeeping and basically that you know I, I see my finances every month and at the end of the year. But right now, I mean, I don't know how it's going in the US given uh, what's happening with the COVID crisis. I think all your tax filings are late. Everything is delayed for the next three months, if I'm not mistaken. So it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, here really the tax filing date remains the same, but the payment dates, if you're someone that typically owes, has been pushed back a little bit. So, uh, and a lot of us that do structure our businesses utilizing like the S corp election, our due date was still three days ago as as we're recording. Um, but if we're identified as someone requiring to pay, we get a little bit of grace. On those payments. So again, it's changing daily. There's more and more opportunities for small businesses. So I'm interested in seeing what type of programs become available. Yeah, and especially for cash flow, right? I mean, for small businesses, I think one of the biggest things for like e-commerce and everybody else is like cash flow. Like how much cash flow do we have in the bank? And especially like for us, what's happened if you work in e-commerce is the last two months have pretty much decimated us in terms of you know the production lines in China going down and everything else. So like for us, the cash flow is extremely crucial. And you know we don't want to be in a situation where uh, I mean, we have we, we'll have to lay off employees at a certain point in time, but the thing is, uh, you know, the question is how soon or how late. So, uh, in, in, yeah, in such in such, I, I, I made this mistake before once, right? It's basically like in such times, do you start leaning yourself out so you can actually like uh, bunker down and you know 
look in the long term and say, look, I am going to be stronger in the long term, so I can keep like five or six employees with it, or you just say, look, I'm I'm going to be the leader, I'm going to go on the ship, and you have like 15 employees, and you just continue spending the, at the same run rate, and in six months you don't have anything left in the bank. So you right. need to like make those decisions, and we need to have people like you know, uh, bean ninjas or whoever it is, uh, giving us that sort of data to make that decision with, which I think would be the ideal way to go about it. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, I think that's what's so powerful to us is seeing now the interest. You know, the best time to have understood your numbers was really like 12 months ago. The second best time is right now. So it's not too late. So I think most importantly, people really need to know their numbers. And the important number is how much cash do you have on hand? And what does your cash flow cycle look like? You have a burn rate against that burn rate. You have incoming cash that... Yeah. In some in some cases, you really can rely upon and count on with with a high degree of accuracy. For others, it's volatile. So you also need to start making that list. What are those mandatory expenses, those fixed costs that I have to take on each and every month? But beyond that, what can I? What do I have to pay in hard currency and cash? And what can I pay otherwise? Maybe on a credit card, on another. Um, you know, some other method of payment to help you delay that cash expenditure. And yeah, and especially in e-commerce, right? Where people uh, always go by by revenue metrics, which I think is like quite sad because, you know, revenue is a fool's metric. Of course, at the end of the day, if you don't know how much money and uh, profit you have in your bank account, why, you know, you shouldn't be in business. So that's, I'm glad you brought it up actually. So you actually Absolutely. know your fixed costs, you know how much money you're spending on ads and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I know people who have, I was talking about like, oh, hey, man, this guy has a $25 million Amazon business. Like, how much is he actually taking home? It's like $100,000. like, what the hell? That's <laughs> yeah. It's probably working so, really hard for that the same amount you can make on a yeah. much lower. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Right, exactly. And I think there's a misconception, too, that profit is cash. And it's not. Like, you may have no. terms that you had taken earlier that there's debt payments that are coming across your balance sheet. And there's other areas of commitments that you made that reduce that profit number to where your cash number might be something entirely different. And I'm glad you mentioned marketing campaigns. A lot of people are saying, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to cut marketing. Well, that's like killing your, uh, the nutritions that are then feeding the body. So to us, it's like, yeah, absolutely review your marketing strategy and ensure and take this time to really understand, are you getting a return on that ad spend that allows for you to, continue to make that investment. And in some cases, it may make sense for you while everyone else is coming short of spend in that area to try to gain market share and just get and put out a little more so you can get some brand awareness. Exactly. And that's, and that's what it is, right? It's like, you, you can't, you can't cut the hand that actually feeds you in that sense. It's like people are like, Oh, wait a second. It's like, uh, you know, uh, you know, where people, where people are interested and all these things, and people just go like, "Wait a second, like, uh, uh, well, okay." So, hey, so let me let me let me try and challenge uh, your listeners here a little bit, right? Most people go when a recession happens. The first thing that people kill is advertising, and they kill the market. Okay, fair enough. You kill your advertising, you kill the market. But then, how are people going to hear about your business? Right. So, Absolutely. so it's exactly the same thing. It's like the first thing they're always like anybody, any organization that I've ever worked at, if. Any of them see a hard time, they go, marketing needs to go. It's like, well, man, come on. You can't really have that happen. They say, maybe you can lean it down. Maybe. So right now, for example, Amazon and Best Buy and all these guys, they're cutting the ad spends down by 10 to 15%, which is an opportunity for a smaller business like us. It's like, holy shit, man, that's great. Like, We have 10 to 15% more market share that we can actually get out of, out of Amazon not actually being on the market. It's like, wow, that's, that's perfect. Like, Why not? Yeah, absolutely. So... Thanks for taking the time today, Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up to a close. I, I just want to give an opportunity to you too. Is there anything you'd like some support with or, or want to share with the Bean Ninjas community? No, no, nothing. nothing. I just want to say I'm really thankful and I really am very grateful for, for you know, uh, for the whole team. You know, I, I get to meet you guys at different conferences and I get to actually spend time with you guys and you guys are nothing but like an amazing bunch of people. And, you know, and the services that, you know, that you guys have have definitely helped, helped a lot of entrepreneurs that I know out. So I really, really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much for saying that. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Take care, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. In a recent industry survey, 
was found that 41% of e-commerce businesses have done nothing to compare for an economic crisis. But what are the top sellers doing and how has the recession impacted these e-commerce sellers? Well, to find out, Bing Ninjas have created a survey to gauge the impact of the economic recession on seven-figure e-commerce sellers. And we'd love for you to take part. The more data we can gather from different e-commerce sellers, the better analysis that we can put together. And we'll be sharing the results and expect that it will be helpful for all e-commerce store owners to benchmark themselves against what's happening in the industry and also how they're tracking compared to some of the top e-commerce sellers out there. You can take the survey at bninjas.com forward slash forward slash recession survey. That's bninjas.com forward slash recession survey or one word. And the survey closes on the 5th of June. Thanks so much for your participation. And if you know of any other e-commerce merchants who might be willing to complete the survey or who might benefit from the results, then please share it with them too. Thanks.